Hello my friends. Welcome to Lindy's Magpie Reads. This is a place where I talk about books. I read a lot of books and as March is coming to a close, I was thinking about the many readathons that there are on booktube and this year I haven't participated in many of them, but one of them I guess I'm participating by accident. There's a float plane, hang on. And that is uh, March of the Mammoths. I've, since February, I've been reading a Suitable Boy with a group of great women. And we're, we're moving along through it. It's been a wonderful experience. So that would qualify as a mammoth. <laughs> Hooray, March of the Mammoths. What I really wanted to say about reading A Suitable Boy is that I think that might be what is affecting my reading mood lately. Uh, in my last video, I mentioned that I have been so fussy, so very fussy recently, uh, about what books I want to read. And I think it's because A Suitable Boy is so good. It's exquisite writing and there is not, uh, not just any book can match that. And now I've got the cat coming onto my lap. <laughs> oh. Right. So, uh, other readathons this month include uh, March Mystery Madness, and I almost never read mysteries. However, I used to. So, uh, Jolene of uh, Bookworm Adventure Girl, she recently posted uh, an original tag, Don't You Forget About Me, and I will link that down below. And it made me want to uh, do the tag and look back on my reading. So I grabbed my first reading journal when I started keeping track of the books that I read. And that was in 1994. And as I flipped through those pages, every month I read several mystery books. So yeah, <laughs> I was reminded about how mysteries used to be a big part of my reading. Uh, and our tastes change, don't they? Uh, so, no mysteries in the month of March for me this year. Uh, what other readathons? There's the Irish readathon, and I love Irish authors, but this month, nada. I don't think I've read a single Irish author, uh, but probably in the coming months I will. And then there's, um, oh, March Middle Grade Madness. Now this I have participated in, and in this video later on when I talk about the books I finished recently, I have two books of middle grade fiction and there are five prompts in the uh, readathon. I'm going to link the announcement video down below. It's fantastic because all of the women who are participating have got cameos in the video talking about it. Anyway, I in these two books I've managed to incorporate all five prompts. So you'll hear more about that later on in this video. And when I looked back on my reading for this year, I think I've read about 10 middle grade novels so far. So uh, yeah, it's just interesting to look back and look back far or look back just in the past year and think about why I'm picking up the books I'm picking up and you know what's striking my fancy. If you have comments on any of this, 
participating in readathons or read-alongs like the big uh, a suitable boy readathon please uh, drop me a note in the comments down below okay so okay well, i'm gonna put you down Come on. down you go and i'm going to start talking about the books uh, that i have read and since my last video uh, there actually are eight and that is way too many for one video so i think i will tell you about four or five five maybe including uh, three that are by mexican or mexican-american authors yeah and then those two middle grade novels. There's some overlap there. The first book I want to tell you about is I listened to an audio and it's A Council of Dolls by Mona Susan Power. Now her first book, uh, The Grass Dancer, came out in 1994. And so when I looked back in my reading journal, I remember picking it up. Uh, uh, yeah, it was there, but I had not retained, you know, really very much of the novel itself. I just remember that I picked it up because I find the grass dancer regalia so interesting. I think it's my favorite of all. Uh, indigenous dance regalia and that was the reason why I picked up the novel all right let's get on to a council of dolls now this one is told in four parts and it's about three women in one family of uh, Dakota Sioux women we first meet Sissy in the early 60s She's a child not yet going to school. And then the next section, we back up in time to when her mother was a child. And then in the next section, we back up in time again to Sissy's grandmother, Cora. And she was in high school uh, during that part. And she's uh, keeping a journal. And that actually was my very favorite part of the book. I do love writing that's in um, epistolary format. Anyway, Cora is going to Carlisle Residential School uh, and she lived there for years separated from her family. In the fourth section we go back to Sissy but in contemporary times. Sissy as an adult and I have to say that was my least favorite part of the book. Uh, there's a lot of um, therapy speak that wasn't my favorite, but on the other hand, um, like in the author note, she talks about how writing this novel was healing for her, for the author, and that she hoped it would be healing for readers as well. And I could see how, uh, how that was the, the arc of this book, which is about the trauma experienced through the generations of Indigenous people in America. Before I forget, I want to mention that A Council of Dolls is on the Carol Shields long list. I will include a link down below. I think I've read six now that are on that list. The audiobook is read by Isabella Star LeBlanc, who is also Dakota Sioux, and she did the audio narration for Angeline Bouley's uh, two novels. The Firekeeper's Daughter and Warrior Girl Unearthed. I do recommend the audiobook. And it's interesting how uh, there were so many connections between this book and other books that I have read recently. So 
For example, Tommy Orange's novel Wandering Stars, so also about Indigenous um, multi-generational um, families and told with storylines that move through time. Uh, although in the case of Wandering Stars, these go back and forth. It's not so much uh, linear. And then also Wayward by Amelia Hart. Uh, now this is set in England and it's about a family of witches. And in this one, we go also back and forwards in time, but it's about three different women in one family in different generations. So just, uh, hmm, I guess I like that, uh, that writerly style because I like that there is a sense of history, a sense of time passing, and uh, yeah, there's just something whole and satisfying about books that have that structure for me as a reader. But there are some other coincidental links as well. So in A Council of Dolls, uh, for each of the storylines, there's an important doll and uh, a bit of a supernatural aspect because the doll acts as kind of an invisible friend um, with a voice that's helping the girl whose doll it is. And in two other books that I've read, actually both memoirs, dolls have a significant part. Uh, yeah, in one of them, an essay talks about being a child and um, enacting suicide with Barbie dolls. <laughs> I can't take it anymore! And throwing them out a 10-story window. And in another one, uh, the author as a child, he loved these action figures and his older siblings always teased him um, that he was playing with dolls. So, yeah. And on a more serious note, two of the books that I've read recently, uh, and I'm not going to tell you which ones because I don't want any spoilers, two of the books talk about babies being killed by having their fontanel pierced. And two books talk about women who murder someone with an axe. And two books talk about a person who survives under a pile of dead bodies. So <laughs> go figure, what are the chances? I mean, I, I do read about a book a day, so um, the chances increase, I guess just by volume, but still, that's a little bit strange, don't you think? And then one more thing. In A Suitable Boy, there is a character who's talking about uh, clues in solving a crossword puzzle and how uh, he had a leg up over his British friend because um, one of the words, uh, loot, comes from a Hindi word and I, I somehow I missed that. When I read the book Loot by Tanya James, uh, I did not know that loot comes from Hindi. So learning things all the time. Okay, so on to the rest of the books. Uh, these next three are all by Mexican or Mexican-American authors, starting with the novel Stillborn by Guadalupe Natel. It's a short novel that I picked up because it was on the best books of 2023 by uh, a couple of different booktubers that I follow, Bob the Booker and uh, Sophie of Bibliosophie. So I will link their best of videos down below in case you haven't seen them. And 
I loved it. <laughs> Absolutely loved it. It's about a woman who from a young age was determined she would not have children. And she had a friend, another woman in university who felt the same way. And they were just as close as close could be. But then as they got older and this friend married and let her know that uh, she was trying to get pregnant, it really affected their friendship. But there's other things going on as well. Um, our narrator's relationship with her mother. Her mother wants her to have kids. There's a next door neighbor who is a single mother and she seems to be neglecting her small child. Uh, so many uh, ways of looking at um, mothering and whether or not to have kids and alternative forms of parenting children. Uh, it was uh, succinct and um, really effective emotionally with the characters a real straightforward kind of style. Uh, yeah, beautiful, absolutely beautiful. The book was translated from Spanish by Rosalind Harvey and I loved it, yeah. Kitty, <laughs> you have to go back down again. Oh. So these next two are by Mexican American authors, starting with Creep by Miriam Gerba. So last night, my Lesbian Plus book club discussed this one. Uh, we had also talked about her first book, Mean, um, back when it came out. I recommend them both. Gerba is so fierce and clear in her writing about misogyny and racism, uh, her own experiences and broadening that to other women, other Mexican Americans. There was just one essay about her grandfather that didn't quite work for me. I really liked all the rest of it. it. It's the kind of issues that can just enrage a person uh, and make you sad. Uh, so for example, the way that male misogynists uh, use these different tactics to control their wives and girlfriends. And one of them is claiming that they're just joking. Can't you take a joke? This is, I'm just being funny when I say uh, to our kids that you can, uh, if you don't find your mother when you come home from school, look under the ground in the back garden where we buried the dog. Just joking. She expresses her opinions about Joan Didion and her writing. And there's another essay uh, that's actually her review of American Dirt by Janine Cummins. That was, um, she was commissioned to write and then the review was rejected. Too harsh. <laughs> uh, that it's a great review. She also has a lot of humor. So if you're looking for something sharp and funny, pick up Creep. And next I'm going to tell you about a memoir in graphic format, Mexicid by Pedro Martin. So this book fits three of the middle grade March prompts. It's got a one word title, it's a debut, 
and it's an immigration story. So again, if you're interested in uh, middle grade March, look for the link down below. Mexicid got so many accolades in the 2023 American Library Association uh, Youth Awards and it was on so many best book lists. I'm so glad that I finally got to it. I loved it so much. Martine is talking about his family. He comes from a family of nine and he's somewhere near the younger end. Uh, but his older siblings, uh, many of them were born in Mexico. He was born in the U.S. And he does talk about how his parents are the most Mexican, his older siblings are more Mexican than American, and he and his younger siblings are more American than Mexican. So there's that question of identity uh, that is part of this memoir. Uh, also, the event that he's describing in the book is a, a very important trip that he took with his family. I think this was in the late 70s. They had a motor home and they traveled from Southern California where they lived to the state of Jalisco uh, to get their grandfather because he was coming to the States to live with them. That's actually another tie because Miriam Gerba also talks about going to um, Jalisco uh, because that's where her family is from. Anyway, when I was 12 or 13, my family traveled from St. Paul, Alberta down to uh, Southern California in a motorhome and it was a Winnebago very similar to the one described in this book could have been the identical same uh, model even uh, and traveling with a whole group of people I come from a family of five kids so not quite as many as Martine's but still uh, the ups and downs of traveling and the enclosed space with your family. It, it was really a trip down memory lane for me, but also a, uh, a really fun adventure to follow. Martine does a great job of uh, enlivening the trip with all of their adventures and misadventures. Yeah, I highly, highly recommend Mexicid. And this is the last book I'm going to tell you about. <laughs> Another one that I loved, Simon Sort of Says, and it's by Aaron Bow, who's a uh, Canadian author. This book, again, so many accolades, including a Newbery Honor. Uh, my YA book club discussed it recently. It's definitely on the lower end of YA. It's for an audience of ages 9 to 12. And like Mexicid, I recommend this to adults also. You will get a lot out of it. And the two prompts from Middle Grade March that this one uh, satisfies is it's got an animal on the cover and it is a book that I have been meaning to get to since uh, all those awards last year. Not to mention, I have read other books by Erin Bow. So uh, her book, Plain Kate, which is a fantasy that won the TD Children's Book Award back in 2011. Uh, I really enjoyed that. And I got another middle grade novel, Stand on the Sky. That won a GG Award in 2019. And uh, that one was set in the, um, amidst the Kazakh nomadic people. It's about a girl and her eagle. Uh, and then this one is contemporary times. Right from the beginning, we know that something has, uh, something 
traumatic has happened to Simon, who's 12. And his family has moved to an entirely different town, a place of um, radio silence because there are these big uh, dishes aimed at outer space, uh, wanting, uh, waiting for uh, any kind of radio signals from outer space. And so Wi-Fi and microwaves and uh, Bluetooth, you know, stuff like that is not allowed in this town. So there's no internet. And this is important. The reveal doesn't happen until quite far into the book. And the author does a good job of keeping that suspense. But she also does a fantastic job with humor. I was laughing out loud so many times. So there are definitely tragic, serious uh, issues in this book. And it's also very, very funny. I'm going to read just a little bit to you, give you an idea of her style. So Simon's mother is an undertaker. And in this town that they move to, they take over a funeral home, which has uh, uh, two entrances, front and back. The front is the funeral part of the funeral home. The back is the home part. The front side, the funeral side, has an elaborate garden. I'm talking crunching gravel paths, little nooks with benches, a fountain, and an actual peacock. It wraps around the side of the house and it's called the Garden of Peace and Memory. The back side of the house has two garages, a hearse garage and a regular garage, and between them a scruffy little private yard just big enough for some recycling bins and a saggy gray picnic table mum wants to replace. It's fenced off with the same elaborate wrought iron as the Garden of Peace and Memory, but around the Garden of Recycling and Crabgrass, the fence is peeling and rusted and the gate screeches. That would be fine, except the peacock, who has a tail the size of a golf umbrella and a brain the size of a shriveled lima bean, always thinks the sound is another male peacock. Like, every day he thinks this. And every day he comes bursting out from behind the hearse garage or down from the porch roof or up from the pits of hell to challenge that other peacock to a duel. He yodels and sticks his neck out like a goose. He snaps and spits and attempts to rake you with his spurs. He is not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but he does have some very sharp parts. We call him Pretty Stabby. Okay, that's all I've got for you today. Thank you so very much for listening. I always appreciate hearing from you in the comments down below, so please say hello and tell me whatever you want to talk about. I'm going to leave you with some scenes from Butchart Gardens, which I visited a few days ago. The bulbs are up, the trees are blooming. It's a lovely place. Enjoy. See you again soon.